I'm Rod Braun, and this is Doug. Most of you probably know Doug McLeod. I'm going to tell you about how we met. I've lived at the foot of Tobacco Row Mountain for almost 50 years on Salt Creek and got interested in just the local history there from the old road, the old road biz that crisscrossed the foot of the mountain and run down Salt Creek, that run down the, behind the house. And years ago, I uh, put a spot back in on the creek. I wanted to put a picnic table. And in cleaning up on the side of the road there, I exposed the laid stone. And that, that told me it was older than just old farm road. And that sent me to the library and the Amos County history book. And after reading a little bit about the history, realized that that old road led about a mile and a half down the most beautiful pristine creek hollow through the woods to the river at the site of a river town called Bethel. Well, I, I learned that uh, Dr. Bill Trout, he had done, and I got some of his atlases, he had done all the rivers in Virginia and just a beautiful, a uh, brilliant thing that were topographical maps along all the rivers and he had put the historical sites and uh, historical events it, it, on them and just so easy to follow and read about and learn about. I found out that he was doing the upper James from Lynchburg up and he was of course the head of the Canals and Navigation Society and so I called him in Richmond, wanting to get uh, the, a copy of his Atlas of the Upper James if I could. And he told me to, uh, and I asked him if he knew if anything, of course, he knew about Bethel. But he said, well, I needed to get in touch with his man in Lynchburg, Doug McLeod. Well, I didn't know Doug, but my family did. <laughs> Doug had written a book about his family and my family's in it come to find out that our great-grandfathers were cousins in Scotland. And they came to America uh, around the turn of the century and worked as blacksmiths in Lynchburg. That's how I met Doug. And one of the first things we did, of course, I called him and, you know, I, by then I knew we were kin. And uh, one of the first things we did, my neighbor Pat Woody had built a bateau. And we caught a ride on that bateau Spent about a week on a, going to uh, Daniel James to Richmond. The high adventure of my life, I guess. <laughs> Amen. We, uh, <laughs> we had a time. 20 and, uh, years ago, yeah, this year. We had a time. And uh, we just going by, going down the river and going through, going by the <laughs> historical sites and uh, and learning so much from everybody uh, that we met along the river. It was just a, a wonderful thing to happen. So anyway, we got back and uh, I, I had an old pontoon boat I kept over on the river. And we started exploring the river and, and actually Bethel from the river. And uh, that was a just completely different perspective. At that time, Bethel, the site of Bethel was just about inaccessible. The 85 flood had taken the bridge out and you couldn't hardly get in there any other way. And so we, we started exploring it from the river. I'll tell you how I stumbled on this map that started this whole mystery. The business associate, his office was on the second floor there. And I went up, first time I'd been up at us to visit him, went in that door there on the right and up set of steps to the second floor. Hanging on the wall there was an old, uh, uh, old map. It really was just an antique reproduction. An old map that I hadn't seen before. And that's a 1718 French map of America. This uh, gentleman that made that map, the cartographer, was William Glazelle. And I had read about him. His father and grandfather were cartographers. Of course, he never came to America. And it's amazing, the detail of this map. One, one of the things I, it, that surprised me about it is right there is Chicago. <laughs> And I think it was probably an Indian village, but they, this was one of the first uh, fur trading or uh, fur, the way they moved fur, the French were big fur traders. And they were doing all of that around uh, the mid 1500s. 
hence the detail of the map. Well, you know, our Amos County history was supposedly just starting them then. Trader Hughes was probably just kind of pulling up to Otter Creek with his Indian princess. <laughs> and that was speculated that that's why he was able to stop at that time. But anyway, I walked up to the map and uh, just tried to get orientated and focused in on it. James Rubble, you see there, R to James. And that mountain hit me and I just looked at it and I said, I had the thought then that it, 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 it looked like High Peak Mountain. Uh, that's what we always call it, Tobacco Row Mountain. It's got a name on it. 1718, so it just didn't make sense to what we knew of history, or what I knew of history anyway. And my business associate, he was, I was just starting to be able to use a computer, but he was, he had the big printer and he was uh, way ahead of me and stuff. And anyway, I left at his office that day with a big copy of that map. First thing I did was go back to my shop and I Googled Mount Edlow. It came back no results. Mm. And so spent about five years calling the Williamsburg, Jamestown, people at the Library of Virginia and asking them if they knew anything about a mountain in central Virginia called Mount Edlow. Nobody knew anything. So, but five years later, this would be 2007. Finally got a Google search. I repeatedly looked for things on the internet with no results. But after 2007, that was the 400th anniversary of Jamestown. And the historians did a recompilation of Virginia history. It was called the Virginia Byways. It returned a notation and the Augustine Herman map. Let me just see, here's the James River going up right here. You can blow it up there if you can. We'll get on the falls maybe. It's a sideways, but that's yeah, it. That, uh -huh. yeah. well, that's it, there's the. That's good right there. So, and go on up uh, to the top of the map there, Doug. So here's the James River. You can drop down, we'll look at Richmond right there, or the falls. All right, excuse me, y'all. That's okay. We got so there, there's the James River Falls right there. Mm -hmm. That would be our Richmond now, of course. There was only about a dozen plantations west of the falls at this time. And then, of course, the James River moving on west. Well, lo and, behold, lo and behold, there it is again. This is the only other document that's got Mount Edlow on it that we found. There's no written word anywhere only these two maps. And that notation, when I read it, that's, that's all we know of it, but it tells everything that uh, there is to know. It says, this name derives from a person that was in his infancy taken prisoner in the last massacre over Virginia and carried amongst others to this mount by the Indians which was their watch hill, the country thou about being champion and not much hilly. And to me, that was a perfect description of the back of Roe Mountain. It's the only mountain standing alone with nice flat farmland around it. So I've got some pictures here that just kind of show, this is a, a view of the mountain from Mount Athos Road. The river is right here. You see that dark shadow coming around there. The, on the right here, it makes a big loop right here. They call it Big Bent. The river turns and heads back west. Potato Hill is setting up just right about there. And uh, the river almost touches the mountain right there, Potato Hill. And this, is, this shows you it's got probably better than a 180 degree boundary of the James River around this mountain. So moving up the river, probably about six miles out, this is uh, taken from the Viaduct Bridge, Earl Lynchburg. If you were down on the river in a boat right there, that mountain would disappear below the tree line now. So we still don't see it. You wouldn't see it from the river. So here's a picture of the river just trying to, I mean, I'm sorry, the mountain just trying to show you the country thereabout 
being champion and not much hilly. This picture was taken over on Wine, where Wine South Road comes out and hits Cedar Gate. Over the ridge right here, you would go move out over uh, Speed to Plow Orchard and Mar uh, the Morris Orchard, I think, is to the right here. But anyway, Apple Orchards were around the foot of the mountain. This is a view of the mountain taken from the other side looking east. And again, you can see this flat land. This is about the flattest place you've ever seen up there. Is it from the Naola? It's from Naola, mm -hmm. from the Naola area. On over those trees, you're gonna uh, hit the uh, Petal River Gorge. And then you'll go, you'd go to the right, of course, and go around through by Potato Hill and the gap between the mountain and Potato Hill. Here's so, a blow up of the French map. Because we're gonna do that. Well, you, you can show that again. Because right. I wanted to show you, there is the falls right there, that little break in the river. See if I can hold this a little steadier. Right there is the falls. And you'll see leaving, it'd be our Lynch, uh, Richmond area, of course. Leaving now, you've got that bump up north and coming back south. And there's a second one bumped up north, coming back south. And then it, the river going south and makes that crescent right there. So let's go to the Google Earth. Here's the same thing, and I took this, uh, I, I tried to get it as big as I could, but Richmond's going to be just off the map right there. So there's the James River, that blue line right there, coming from Richmond. And there's a bump up north and back south, the second one up north and back south. Goes north a little farther, that's Scottsville right there. That's the farthest north the river runs before it turns south and comes back. And here's the crescent again. It's a little bit out, you know, but the man never left uh, Paris, probably. <laughs> and here's our mountain right here, showing the country that cleared land around it right oh, there. Yeah, yeah. It's the first mountain on the north side of the James River. It bothered me that the mountains were so far <laughs> to the west in relation to our mountain. I ran across this analysis of this map done by a uh, college, uh, somebody graduating uh, college. It's a stack of papers about that thick, believe it or not. Most detail, I, I didn't read all of it, but I read up to the point where he talked about uh, politics coming into play with maps. Of course, the French own the entire rest of the country or claim the entire rest of the country other than the four English colonies here on the East Coast. They wanted the colonists to end at the mountains. And you can see that, of course, they had the established colonial lines here that had already been laid out, so they had to be accurate enough to actually have them where they're supposed to be. But they drew the mountains on the line. And, of course, we know it's four rows of mountains, so they were probably just showing the fourth row, wanting it to be the first row. <laughs> but that's why, uh, they, and the, the title of that uh, thesis was telling the truth by lying. <laughs> and it was a lot of that going on in history. <laughs> the people that are in power get to write the history. So that hence the recompilation or the attempt to straighten things out uh, with the uh, 2007 Virginia Byways. Mm -hmm. But we're here again at our building. Well, this building was here, of course, 120 or so years before this. There it is right there, same building. And that is my great-grandfather, and that is Doug's great-grandfather. <laughs> and that's the second big coincidence. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Doug has taken this thing a little farther and found a lot more details, and I'm going to sit down and take a drink of water. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> I just love history. I was telling somebody earlier, I love local history. I love Virginia history. I love Virginia. Anything on the river above Lynchburg for some reason is my territory that I like. Like Rod has brought light to this Mon Edlo. And I thought, well, that seems like it's overlooked. I don't see where anybody has ever written about it. I don't find anything. When I met Rod 20 years ago on Pat Woody's boat, named Tobacco Row, by the way, which is- I noticed he was very focused on this. There's five 
stages of study that I did, and there I'm going to only be brief with them. The first one is about the last massacre. I'm going to have to read from this because it's too much for me to remember, too. But uh, tobacco was the major cash crop in 1644, and the Crown colonists were continuing to claim and encroach land along the rivers, draining into the Chesapeake Bay. Opican Cano, this might be a picture of him or just a likeness, uh, had assumed the role of Werowance soon after his brother or cousin Powhatan had died in 1618. Opican Cano was a little more necessarily defensive than his predecessor and resided on the Pamunkey River and had uh, support of numerous Algonquin speaking tribes, too many to mention. The Tassin Tassis, as the colonists were called by the Algonquins, had over the years relied upon the natives for uh, food, information, and there was trade, but there was depredations and killings because there was no trust. And uh, so on April 18th of 1644, uh, the colonists were likely low on food after winter and out planning again. And though very old, Opie Can Cano got to thinking that's, and that, uh, there they are in a weak point. And there's this, he's heard of this English civil war across the sea. There's not the ships and the supplies coming in. Maybe this is a good time. And he sent word to have a series of attacks along the rivers below the fall line. Uh, and against the colonists. And this was the third and last anglo powhatan uprising. The Royal Virginia Assembly stated nearly 400 colonists were slain. Helen Roundtree, an anthropologist and writer of several books on the Virginia Indians, wrote that a large number of captives and hostages were taken for ransom. The infant Edlo and others were among them. See, I'm looking for captives for that time period. I've found only a couple accounts about captives and survivors in 1644. There was an Oxford trained doctor, John Woodson, riding home from seeing the patient. He was killed while his home was being attacked, but his wife and children survived. The other account is uh, written by a 19th century scholar, Margaret Worley, who had been captured by the Indians, and later she sent a letter to the officials mentioning Opecon Cano wanted a redemption of the captives and a treaty of peace. Well, it was agreed to have an armistice and for the governor to go to front, uh, Fort Royal on the Pamunkey River and confer with some of uh, the chief's principal men. And there was uh, an interpreter there, of course, named Henry Fleet. But the conference never took place. And what the shame is, I keep hearing about interpreters. They had to be interpreters all over. Too bad no one wrote in the, their experiences to some some degree because... One of them would have known something about Edlow being the captives and the Indians uh, translating and, and maybe what became of it. So the next area of uh, my study, the second one, is response. The Virginia Council records for that time period, 1644, was, would have recorded a lot more details uh, concerning the massacre and response, but they were destroyed in Richmond when Richmond burned 1865. Despite the, the uh, English Civil War going on between Charles I and Parliament over the Irish insurrection, an expedition against the Virginia Indians began in July of that same year under William Claiborne, who got 300 men from seven of the eight counties in existence at that time. And those counties were to pay for the expenses of horses and uh, ammo boats uh that's how you know for a three weeks span of time uh trade with the indians was forbidden indian corn was cut down and some of uh, the boats their bo boats were burnt in uh in that three week span of time but i've yet to find a mention of a party to rescue captives then so in august uh of the following year the governor sent out a party to get Opican Cano. They were armed horsemen and they captured the 90 year old man and took him to Jamestown and jailed him and shot him in the back. After the uprising, they built forts everywhere. Fort James, Fort Charles, Fort Royal, 
on the Pamunkey River. The third topic is the Edlow name from the True Tales of the Boyce family written by Virginia Rowlings. I don't think she's kin to a Harry Potter author or anything. But I found it curious when she said the Potomac Indians, she probably meant the Powhatan Indians, returned Alice Boyce on April 3rd, 1623, the chiefest prisoner of the Second Massacre. That was Jamestown, 1622. She repeatedly petitioned the um, assembly that the interpreter, Robert Poole, be uh, release other captives that were out there. Well, Poole apparently was a double dealing, low down scoundrel. He must have been. That's my take on reading Helen Roundtree's book about three Indian lives changed by Jamestown. Poole played both sides, so it's it's clear that's you know people do that. Roundtree mentions that Alice. When she was returned to Jamestown, the captive Alice Boyce, having done ordinary work as a captive, came dressed in, to the hilts with beautiful leathers and decorations and everything, uh, as if she was a wife of a Werowitz, which is a chief. So uh, she sent word to Jamestown that Obi Kankano wanted that pool guy out of there. They want another interpreter. So. Uh, anyway, um, if it's true that Alice immigrated on the Bona Nova in the year 1622, as is recorded, she was captured the very same <laughs> month that she got off of that boat. And who knows how long that she stayed there uh, captive, but she later married a man named Luke Boyce. And Luke Boyce was an early Burgess in the Bermuda 100 plantation area. And they had at least one daughter, uh, Hannah. So Alice came into her husband's estate when he died two years later after they got married and thereafter married a man named Matthew Edlow. Alice came into her husband's estate and then married uh, Matthew Edlow, who came to America in 1618. And he lived at a place called Arrowhattock that was a site of an abandoned Indian village uh, in Charles City County, one of the original eight counties. Matthew married Alice Boyce uh, at 1627 or, or so. He served as a Burgess um, a couple of years later and then died by 1635, so his widow was at granting granted land from Henrico and Arrowhattox. So uh, there was a son, Matthew Edlow Jr., uh, who may have been the captive, but the dates don't jive. And it really, it's, it's hard to figure out if he was it. And especially didn't write of it. He didn't write anything of it because he became a lieutenant colonel in the militia and he, he became a Burgesses in 59, 1659. And, it's just um, odd that nobody seemed to write about it. But, but, there's bound to be other siblings. We don't know. Anyway, no one in the Edlow family that I've found has appeared to written anything about captives, nor did Alice Boyce Edlow, who was a captive herself, she had two captives in her life. If anything was written, it hadn't come to light. Or else Alice, uh, she's just an extraordinary woman all of a sudden from doing this research. So, all right, moving on to. Doug, can I say something before we go? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, if you want to go back to that, that'd be a good way to talk about it there. Oh, yeah. So, my, uh, I did a little research uh, on Ancestry.com. In the Ancestry.com papers, on the Edlow family with Matthew the first and Matthew the second and Alice who married Matthew the first they all list well actually they say that uh, Matthew the first died in 1637 Doug says that date's not Right, I, but I have seen it. It was 35, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, I keep 35, finding 35. Pretty close still. They say that 
Matthew Edlow the first died in 37, 1637. Matthew Edlow the second was born the same year, 1637, which is possible. And well, somebody they all still list a younger brother for Matthew Edlow the second. His name was Thomas. He's like a ghost. No birth date and no death date. And unknown, but he's all listed. He's, he's listed as the younger brother on all three of their ancestry profiles. And of course, if Matthew the first had died, Matthew the second was born, and she had another younger. <clears throat> he had another younger brother. It would have been an illegitimate child. Okay. The mystery is what happened to the child. Who was the uh, child? We can't find out. We don't know. Well, it makes you wonder who gave the information to the map maker about the mountain. Right. Was it an Indian? Because Indians did tell him that what they asked, what's furthest to the west? And they just said the Western Sea. Somebody had told them, I guess. But if he, that one reference about the biography of this map maker, Augustine Herman, they, it says that he communicated with Indians. On that Virginia byways, Scrolled on up, and some of those things are almost a day by day account of history to record it. It gets to 1644, and it like it's like it, it's a black hole there. Mm -hmm. And as Doug said, that was the middle of the English Civil War, and it had to have uh, catastrophic effects in the colonies too. But the thing that, that they returned for 1644, the byways return, was the Augustine Herman map, the notation on the map, and the speculation, and that may have been from uh, the book, Adventures of Purse and Persons and Purse. They speculated that Matthew Edlow II must have led an adventurous life. Mm. because they were speculating that he was the child yeah. that was kidnapped Wanting and, to taken, be to, and well, taken to the map. Yeah. Now, it does, you know, if you go by the ancestry of the dates, he would have been seven years old. If he had a younger brother, that would have put him maybe even as an infant as we know it. Yeah, and they were among others. We don't know who uh, those others right, were. Among so, us. But yeah. here's the thing. If it was Matthew Edlow II, and yeah. he was a captive, and he survived, certainly he survived the kidnapping, it looks like he would have worn that as a badge of honor in his life, and at least mentioned it at some point in his life. He never said a word. Nothing was ever said. So the mystery still remains. Who was the inf infant captive? My fourth topic concerns the Monacans. David Bushnell makes mention of Mount Edlow in a 1930s pamphlet called Five Monacan Indian Towns. He quotes that the same map notation on Herman's map and then speculates that Christopher Newport in 1608 was maybe the first European to see Monacans in Virginia. And Bushnell also states that it's believed the Siouan speaking Monacans had mostly left the Ravana River area in 1670 when a German explorer named John Letterer came through. He went to Rasawick. There is Rasawick, the principal village of the five that Mr. Um, Bushnell wrote about. And here's the fork in the river being the Ravana because Rasawick is located there. Now I wanted to just show, we talked about Arrowhaddocks earlier and there it is further down the river. It, it's on the same map. The Monacans that were still in the Rasawick village shot their guns off in celebration of the expedition coming in, which I thought, well, that's how about that? They trading with guns about that time. Some of the uh, concentration of Monacans went south to the Otter River and others went west. This is Revolutionary War era. Uh, the Ravana River is here, named to uh, commemorate Princess Anna. Then at this point, the James River stops and the Fluvanna River begins, and that was known as the Upper James River at that time. Uh, that was a terminus, sort of, where boats or trade occurred. Bushnell suggested that 
The fork of the river on the Herman's map was the Ravana, later on the point of fork. But he goes on to add that he had a, a, another historian, Fairfax Harrison, who said he believed that Mon Edlow could have been further west to where the Ravana passed the southwestern mountain or those historians, they didn't know anything about the French map. They didn't mention it in their book. They never saw the French map. There's a fork on the John, John Smith's map. Yeah. We know that's the Ravana. Yeah. Because of the <laughs> Indian villages, the towns there, we know that is the Ravana. Yeah. Now, if you want to go to Augustine Herman's map, both of these maps, by the way, were orientated looking west. This is before it was standard to orientate the maps to the north. John Smith's map had a life reference of there you go. going on 100 years. All of them did. The French map, they used for almost 100 years. But this is the fork on the Augustine Herman map that Bushnell, he suggested it could have been the Ravana, and there's the mountain. So the reason that can't be the Ravana is here's the Appomattox River coming up right here. And there's where it stops. Now, if the map is accurate, and the maps are pretty accurate, they used, uh, actually, they used the sailing instruments, the sextant, and another instrument, I'm not sure what. But they were going by the latitude and longitude, and that they plotted out the places where they were, and that's how they created the maps back then. So this would be the, in the start of the Appomattox River. If it was, the spring for the Appomattox <clears throat> River starts about 10 miles northwest from the town of Appomattox. Okay. So if that uh, is anywhere close to the spring for the Appomattox River, yeah. that throws out this possibly being a Ravana. Uh, hey. He's not showing any, ro any rivers in to the James going west of the right. plantations. Right. There's a reason for that. I think. You don't want to confuse things. Of course, you got the Ravana. You've got the Rockfish, the Thai. I'm not sure the order's right. And I may be leaving some out, but they all come in on the north side of the James River. All he's trying to say there, and that's frontier going forward, he's trying to tell you where Mount Edlo is. It's the first mountain you're going to hit going up the James River. He's not confusing you with the other rivers. You would cross other rivers, but there's not going to be any mountain. By itself. This being the James going forward, that's showing the river coming in on the south side, and there are no rivers that come in on the south side of the James. After the cartographer assembled all information from word of mouth, old maps, uh, explorers, the people that were using the sailing instruments to plot the latitude and longitudes, everything that had to go together to draw that map, that was just the first step. It then had to go to the engraver in the mid-1600s. Amsterdam was the map-making capital of the world. And what they had to do was engrave these map drawings in reverse on copper plate in order to print them. A lot of mistakes were made in that process of engraving. If he didn't reverse that fork, that's what it would look like. If he'd have reversed the fork, it would have shown you the puddler coming in on the north side of the jungle. This is my favorite map for some reason. It's the first time I've ever seen Tobacco Row Mountain delineated on the map. You know, 80 years had passed since Herman's map, and the need for a more comprehensive map uh, was drawn by Albemarle surveyors Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson. That was Thomas Jefferson's daddy. The Fry Jefferson map was finished in 1751 and uh, as a rough draft and then published four years later first time they did Tobacco Row Mountain and then the Peaks of Otters there and then there's John Peter Salling which is where Glasgow is if you go up to Glasgow there's Salling's Mountain there he was an early explorer and settler there in 1730s he wrote a journal about being captive and, and escaping and everything but it's uh it's just great detail that they they put in they show the mountains, they show the uh, Appalachians, then they show the Alleghenies and on further and even uh, redid the map 
uh, a revision and put a lot of uh, detail in out west, uh, west, beyond Western Virginia to the Ohio River. So the early written, earliest written reference I found was Reverend Robert Rose wrote in his journal that he was uh, riding in 1747, went over to Baccarow Mountain with Dr. Walker to see his friend, a Scotsman named John Harvey, who lived near the Peddler River. Now, here's another great mystery if you're interested. Who named Tobacco Row Mount? You know, we don't know. And that's an interesting thing, too. You know, who names these mountains, you know, in the early days? So here's the standalone mountain. Looking at from the kiosk up on the parkway, there's the mountain. There's Tobacco Row <laughs> standing alone from all these other mountain range of the Appalachians uh, and there's Richmond. So here's the fifth and last topic, the clues. Oop, the, cl the clues is, as we've discussed, the Herman map, uh, the second map of Virginia, the French map. And uh, there was uh, uh, Christian and Warwick uh, had a, a tract of land called the Edlow Tract in this area of um, Glade Springs. It, uh, it's this early farm road. Is it early farm road? Is that what it's called? Early farm. It, it was the old Glade Road. Uh-huh, right. Uh, so Thomas we, Hamilton we, used to take from when they come down 29 to Almas, he yeah. would jump off on the Glade Road. So we learned about the Cam family that had land in that area, and, and they also had land here in Elon. A land grant was for the Cams have been rumored, but we've not ever found one. Uh, anyway, there was a man who had a land grant. His name was John Christian. And he allowed, thanks to Sandy Esposito's research, John Christian allowed uh, John Edlow to survey a thousand acres of land and hold it in trust uh, until he was going to buy it. But he died, and his son reverted the land back to the Christian family. And John Warwick, there's Warwick's Edlow Track, bought it. It adjoined the Cam family's land next to it. Uh, and uh, the Cam family had association with the name Edlow. And we immediately went, Edlow's down there. What's going on? And so we studied. Now we know about the Cam family, which is what's interesting to me. Uh, they lived in this mansion, the manor, that's still there. And uh, that um, it was built in the 1820s, probably by the Cam family. And a portion of the land was sold, as we just saw, to Miss Cam's, uh, Elizabeth Cam's uh, son in law. Elizabeth Cam's husband died in 1818. John Cam was his name. He was a clerk of the court and all kinds of stuff here in Amherst. But he was the grandson of the first royal president of William and Mary, which is the first college in Virginia in 1693. So, no, and I think uh, that John Edlow that had that track. Right given to him was from Charles City County. Yeah. He was from the Edlow area that is today Charles City County. So he's definitely out of the Edlow family, but we don't have that. We thought we had a great clue with the Cam family because their, their land was sold. It was the last 1,200 acres of Cam's land on the Glade Road, which was um, uh, uh, we, Porridge Creek there. So and it was called Edlow Plantation at the time when it was sold to the early family. The names, they, the name they, stuff, yeah, and it, they, it just applied to everything. Edlow Plantation, and it, this the, is a deeds, from there. Yeah. And we thought, well, he, John Tam, being out of uh, Williamsburg and out of this English aristocracy that Named this mountain back in 1644, we speculated that he knew the name of the mountain, and that's why he named his place that. <laughs> but that, that went away with this deed such that we couldn't tie it to the deed. Right. We couldn't tie it to the Cam family through the deed. But thanks to Sandy's work, and thank you, Sandy. And, and she didn't find the plat, though. I opened the book up one day in the courthouse, and this happens to a lot of us that research. 
Sometimes you just open up. I know there's some plats in there, and there's the plat. You just thought, oh, look at that. Ed Lowe, track plantation. Hey, Rod. It took me about a month for me to convince him. He, that he it called was, me and he said, <laughs> he said, I didn't want to tell you this. I didn't want to tell you The this. last piece of the puzzle because I, I that really guy. I didn't want to tell you this. Yeah. But, you know, after thinking about it, it still is relating to Edlo. And like I told Doug then, the elephant in the room is a mountain sitting here that was named in 1644. It don't matter who named it. <laughs> Well, maybe Who he named that track of land. Over. Maybe John Edlow knew something about and, that and mountain. The Cams could have still done it. it we uh -huh. don't know. Here's another possible clue. While I was searching the name Edlow, I came across a man of Indian descent named Edlow Shanks. He lived in Amherst and worked at Sweetbriar College 40 years and worked with the fire department for many years, died in 1979. He was born in 1900 to William and Mary Jane Jack Shanks whose line was from Bath County. Of course, they were Indian descent, but, you know, Indians went further and further west. But there's no way to know if he's Monacan. I asked the author of the book, who lives in Elon, Matahay, Kathy Smoot Carson. That was her uncle, Uncle Edlow. I just got to wondering, now, why would his parents name him that? Is there something there? I mean... Maybe. There's other Ed Lowe names, first names I've seen. Anyway, I'd like to thank you, Rod, for the journey. I'd like to thank y'all for coming. Yeah.